Good afternoon uh, or good evening or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, this is uh, my second lecture for the ABCD reporting course, uh, and I will focus today on the effect sizes for our positive predictive values and analysis frameworks. I have no financial or intellectual conflict of interest. In the first part of this talk, I will uh, review the notion of effect size, standard as effect size, and variation of effect size in time aging. Uh, in the second part, I will uh, go over the positive predictive values and uh, explain where they come from, uh, how to derive those things. And the third part, I will uh, talk about the comparison between the machine learning versus the explanatory analysis framework. This is in the context of, of the reproducibility uh, issues that we have faced in science. Uh, and I will encourage you to look at the Harvard Data Science Review recently uh, out. Uh, showing the uh, number of fields in, uh, of science being impacted by this reproducibility crisis. Uh, our field of neuroimaging um, and, um, and cognitive neuroscience or uh, neuroscience in general is absolutely not uh, exempt from this uh, crisis and hence this course and hence uh, uh, our effort to uh, uh, improve that situation. In that context, reproducibility is often thought to be uh, uh, the re replications, uh, the uh, capacity of relaunching the same pipeline on the same data. Uh, but it's also often conflated with other uh, vocabularies. So uh, replicable is often thought to be uh, the replication of the same uh, analysis pipeline on uh, different data, showing the same results but also robustness is uh, also termed to be the, uh, uh, on the robustness of the pipeline when you vary the pipeline for the same data. I think it's best to think of those things in terms of generalization and how, uh, how the analysis, uh, the results, sorry, is actually reproducible or found again uh, across different generalization uh, axes. For instance, data of course, pipelines possibly, um, the time, stimuli, uh, uh, software, uh, operating platform, and so on and so on. So on which sort of a dimension your analysis is actually generalizable and, uh, and how many times have, hasn't been generalized and hasn't been refound. So this is in the wider context, I think the best way to think about uh, replicability or reproducibility. To introduce the effect, uh, effect size issue, uh, I would like to go back to this slide where, uh, where the uh, variation of the BDNF uh, uh, is uh, the uh, gene and, the, and, the, and its association with the hypotemporal volume. So this slide shows how uh, uh, across time of publication, so with time of publication from 2014, 2011 and so on, um, the effect size of this association between BDNF and hypocampal volume has been found. And you see that with early publication, uh, with the size of those circles representing the size of the cohorts, the number of uh, individuals uh, that have participated in the study, with early studies show, uh, with small cohorts show uh, variable effect sizes from zero to uh, uh, effect size of one, coins the effect of one. And with time, the effect size tend to decrease with the uh, uh, increase of the size of the cohort. So larger cohorts show small effect sizes uh, and possibly uh, no effect size at all. So what is exactly this uh, uh, effect size, Gwen's D effect size? I'm going to review that. But the, uh, the, the take home message of this slide is uh, the larger uh, the number of individuals, uh, the uh, possibly the smaller the, the uh, uh, the effect size is. And small uh, cohort uh, may uh, show a very variable and, and possibly inflated uh, uh, effect size, and therefore significant. So what's the Cohen's D effect size? Uh, well, first, the row effect size, let's take the simple example of two groups uh, where we compute the mean of the two groups, x1 and x2. And the, the row effect size would be simply the difference between the means, or it could be uh, um, bold percentage bold, for instance, or it could be a uh, size of a, a specific uh, anatomical structure and so on. The standardized effect size 
would be uh, that uh, rho FXI is divided by the standard deviation of the, uh, of the data, not the standard deviation of the means. Uh, and, the, and that is the coins the FXI that I was showing on the, in the previous slide. And the, the last um, FXI that we like to relate to, which is very closely related, directly related to the P value, is basically the Z value, which is this uh, coins D FXI um, with some uh, approximately the coins D FXI divided by the square root of N, N being the number of uh, participants in the study. And that uh, is a correction that uh, basically shows you the FX size standardized with the uh, standard division of the means, uh, not of the data. So as soon as you have this square root of n, you think of, a, think of it as a, a, a z value. If you don't have that square root of n, think of it as a coins t FX size. I'd like to go back to the uh, 2015 Brian Nozick experiment, uh, talking about the size uh, in uh, cognitive neuroscience, for instance, or in psychology in this instance. And where uh, here you see on the x-axis the original effect sizes and on the y-axis the replicated effect sizes with a massive endeavor of Brian Nozick and, and the uh, Open Science uh, um, uh, Center for Open Science, uh, replicating, trying to replicate uh, about a hundred um, uh, experiments in psychology with different power uh, shown by the size of the, the, um, of, the uh, of the points. And the, uh, the end result is that um, the FX size, uh, original FX size uh, was about uh, halved when, when during the replication. So the replicated FX size was about uh, 1.2, while the original effect size was uh, on average 0.4. And only 40% of uh, effects were rated to have replicated uh, the original effect. So that's uh, not a good uh, percentage of uh, studies being replicated here. And one of the problem is the power uh, issue. Like, uh, if, if again, uh, thinking of the BNF versus hypotonical volume association, if uh, if um, if the studies have power, um, meaning like in this instance they have a large number of subjects, they usually uh, find small effect sizes. So what is power again? Uh, power is uh, one minus the um, type two error, uh, which is the uh, the, uh, the fact that you are not rejecting uh, the this testing while this uh, while the uh, H one is true. When the alternative uh, hypothesis is true. So if you're not, you're not detecting something that exists, this is the uh, type two error. And one minus this type two error is basically the power, which is the, 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 uh, your capacity of, uh, of finding something that is uh, actually exists. Type one error, of course, is the uh, uh, error when you uh, reject a null hypothesis uh, and therefore de declare that there is um, some signal while there is none. And this is uh, uh, the two uh, distribution we see here, the uh, null hypothesis distribution centered on, on zero, and here uh, an alternative distribution where there is an effect uh, about like a 0.2 point something effect on, on average. And, the, and if you cut the null hypothesis distribution at 0.05, showing like a, with the uh, alpha threshold of 0.05, the gray value here shows the, uh, the probability of detecting the, uh, the effects or the power. And in general, we, uh, the rule of thumb is that you would like to have a power of at least 80%. So you have a, like a very large probability of detecting, uh, of detecting your, uh, the signal when it exists. Obviously, uh, the, more the, the, the larger the signal, the higher this probability is. And when the signal is, is small, then you, you, you will need more subjects to actually be able to detect reliably uh, some signal and reject therefore the null. This is in the context, of course, of uh, null hypothesis testing. The problem is that uh, that's been shown in, uh, by Button et al, uh, for instance, uh, and others, is that in neuroscience in general, uh, power is uh, found to be small. Uh, so power, Button et al show that the, uh, the, the median power is actually less than 50%. So the probability of actually finding uh, the signal when it exists is less than 50%. So there's a, a small number, a small chance of, uh, of finding the, uh, uh, the signal. 
even though all those studies actually have found some signal and therefore there's a chance that the, uh, um, there's an effect size that is inflated, which is, uh, is here shown by the BICE program, that when you uh, estimate an effect size with a small power, uh, with a, a low power studies, <clears throat> you have a chance of detecting a, a, a higher effect size than it actually exists. And the lower the power, the higher the, uh, the bias is. The second problem is that uh, is the uh, positive predictive value is actually going to decrease with low power. And that's, uh, that's something that we'll come back to, but uh, uh, in a nutshell, the positive predictive value is the probability that your hypothesis is actually true, knowing that the, uh, the test is significant. And that probability can be very small if you have low power. Uh, here, for instance, but 30%. Uh, with a, a power of 40%, uh, which is the type of power that is found in those studies. More recently, uh, and more directly related to our neuroimaging uh, uh, field, um, uh, Bodrak et al. shown that, shown that you know, the, uh, the number of, uh, study of uh, a participant in studies uh, is actually increasing with the years, uh, but it's still uh, about 25 on, a, on a, uh, the median uh, number of uh, participants, about 25. So you see the, those, all those studies in 2015 had about like 25, uh, me, the me, median uh, number of studies. We have a, a number of very large studies with uh, many, many, many st uh, and very well powered studies, of course, and uh, but many also uh, have a, a large proportion of studies that have a small number of uh, participants. And the effect size, the coins D effect size that you can detect with this number of participants of 25 is about one. And that's again, the coins D effect size with 80% power uh, detection. So that's, uh, uh, so the question is now, uh, what is the effect size that we find in uh, our neuroimaging studies? And the, uh, the authors of that study uh, <coughs> show that the, uh, they took the uh, HCP data, which is a, a large uh, 1,000 participants uh, uh, study, of, of course, um, and, the, and show that the uh, um, median effect size for, uh, let's say, fMRI uh, studies with a motor uh, um, activi activity or with a, a working memory activity or emotion uh, uh, stimuli, emotional stimuli or gambling, uh, those those effect sizes range between 0.3 to 0.7, let's say. Uh, but the 0.7s are really the ones that are like a you know, sensory motor cortex, very strong activity, um, and the and you know the, uh, the type of uh, of uh, question that are often asked to new functional imaging data uh, is more uh, of the type of, uh, of working memory or emotional, and uh, and that's about 0.3, 0.4, uh, possibly a bit more. Uh, 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 effect size. But with an effect size of 0.4, there's uh, only a power of uh, 30%, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is really problematic in the sense that uh, you, we have uh, very little power uh, with, the, uh, with the number of subjects that we on, on, on in, uh, in the median, uh, median number of subjects. Uh, so that's, we, we are definitely in the in the case where the, the power is too small uh, for, the, for what we are looking uh, to, to uh, detect. So, my, uh, so I'm going to go to part two, but the summary of uh, part one is that many neuromaging studies still lack power, even today. I know that the Paul is uh, is uh, a few years back, but even today, that's still the case. The, large, the lack of power induces uh, inflated effect sizes and affects positive predictive values. And the power estimation requires data variance and effect size estimation. And I would recommend to see the uh, toolboxes by uh, uh, Jockey Dionis or Janet Mumford, Tom Nichols and others uh, on how to compute power uh, for your studies. In this second part of the talk, uh, I will um, explain what is the PPV, the positive predictive value, uh, where the, and the, where does it come from? And we'll do that by recording what is the uh, base theorem. And then uh, explain why PPV is such an important variable and give you some uh, uh, assessment of uh, what that number is or could be. 
uh, and also uh, in the last part, uh, just explain, you know, relate uh, the PPV that we're computing uh, to the PPV that epidemiologists are computing, uh, and, uh, and why this is uh, a bit hard to compute in, in our setting. So uh, to recall the uh, base theorem, I think uh, most of you are probably familiar with it, but uh, I think it is important to have that in mind. Uh, the best way to explain it is with uh, uh, set theory or ensembles, if you want, that represent uh, probability. So here the probability of, let's say, A, which is the set of uh, spam emails, so the, uh, the number of spams, and B here is the number of uh, emails with uh, the label free lunch. Uh, so if you receive an email that is, uh, has the you know, free lunch in it, uh, is it a spam or not? Um, and we're computing here the probability that it is a spam, knowing that it has free lunch uh, in its title or in its uh, body. And this is the probability that we have both, uh, uh, that is both a spam and uh, a free lunch uh, labeled email. So the intersection of those two sets of, e of, of emails, divided by the probability of the free lunch, which is basically uh, the number of uh, free lunch emails. So that's really uh, the gist of the uh, uh, of the base theorem. And if we apply this theorem uh, within in a different setting, uh, here we are, I'm going to talk about uh, hypothesis H A or H one, uh, which is the alternative for the uh, uh, hypothesis, and T S as the you know an event that is the test uh, of this hypothesis is uh, is significant or not. Uh, T S would be is significant. And D, for instance, the data. So, for instance, in our setting, in these settings, the probability of H uh, and uh, D is, uh, as we've seen, probability of H knowing D times the probability of D. And uh, the same thing for uh, if you reverse, but you can reverse H and D, uh, and that's not like the and it can be reversed. And then you have the probability of D knowing H times the probability of H. And if you put those two things together, uh, then you have the classical way of representing the. Uh, uh, the base theorem, the one I've showed you, and the one uh, involving uh, the uh, other conditional probability. So here, probability of H knowing D is probability of D knowing H times probability of H divided by probability of D. So this is a quick recall of the base theorem, uh, but uh, have that in mind and bear with me. Uh, we are going to derive the PPV using the base theorem, and it's not that difficult, that's why I want to show it. Uh, but it still involves a, a, a bit of a manipulation that I, I will uh, explain. So uh, the, what is the PPV? The PPV is the measure of the probability of the alternative hypothesis to be true, knowing that the test is significant. So you have a significant test. Uh, what is the probability of the alternative the hypothesis that you just tested with this test uh, to be true? Uh, so P of HA or H1, uh, knowing that uh, the test is uh, significant, so uh, is positive. So uh, I would say, and as a preamble, that you know, if you don't have a strong, a, a big number there, if, if that number doesn't approach at least, uh, you know, 8, 8, 9, you know, uh, uh, it's it's very hard to engage in a study uh, that has that will have a, a small number here. Uh, because if we do find a, a significant test, uh, we, we can still have predict that the uh, hypothesis will be, uh, uh, the alternative hypothesis is unlikely, could be unlikely, still unlikely. Uh, so what does this hypothesis, this uh, uh, number, this, the, the PPV uh, depend on? What, uh, what, what do you need for computing the PPV? Well, you need the prior probabilities of uh, the alternative and the, uh, and the um, and the null hypothesis, which is the hardest probably, uh, you know, if, if you think of those hypotheses to be random rival, or uh, uh, is, is it likely that you have H, uh, the alternative hypothesis or, or, or not, uh, compared to the uh, null hypothesis? You need the power uh, and you need the risk of error, uh, type one error. So you, you haven't need the, the, those two priorities, priors, but all you can, we can work only with the, uh, the ratio of those two things. So where does it come from? Well, first, uh, write the probability of the test being significant as the sum of the probability of the test being significant on the H1, like you're use, using uh, and H1, plus uh, that uh, test significant and H0. 
So that's clear. That is clear that this is the, this is true. I mean, this this equation is true because uh, you have either H one or uh, H zero uh, mutually exclusive. So that you rewrite that using the basic uh, theorem that we've just seen, uh, and that's involving the uh, conditional probability of uh, uh, that the test is significant on the H uh, HA, so the alternative. Uh, so knowing the alternative uh, uh, and the probability of TS of the test being significant knowing the uh, uh, the null. And then uh, you compute uh, this the, the PPV, so uh, probability of uh, the alternative being true, uh, knowing that the test is significant using the basic equation, and replace the here the, the numerator probability of the of TS uh, by this uh, sum here. And this is what is done uh, in this uh, equation here. Uh, and then you recognize in this equation a number of things. So the probability of TS, uh, the test being significant, uh, uh, knowing that HA is true, uh, that, that conditional probability is just the power uh, that you've seen before. Uh, and the uh, probability of the, of the test being significant, uh, knowing that H0 is true, uh, is uh, the alpha, is the, uh, the, the null hypothesis, the um, uh, risk of error. Uh, so you're declaring it as significant on the H at zero. So this is what uh, this latest equation is telling you. And so you uh, simplify, so you got power times the P of uh, probability of uh, HA uh, here as well. And then alpha times probability of H zero, you divide by probability of H zero and you define R being the ratio of uh, probability of HA over probability of H zero. And this is the formula that you should really uh, retain for, uh, you should uh, uh, have in mind for the uh, positive, uh, positive positive value. So what does it look like under, I would say, normal neuroimaging circumstances? Or, uh, so uh, let's assume, first of all, that our odd ratio uh, R is about 2.2. So you, you've got uh, five times more likely to be under the, uh, the null than in, uh, in the, uh, the, the alternative. So you have a bit of a, like a bold alternative uh, hypothesis, but not a very, like a unlikely one. Uh, and the PPV will, uh, will go from 0.3 to 0.7 uh, as power goes from 0.1 to 0.8. So with 0.8, you often, almost have like a 0.8, uh, you know, 80% uh, chance that your alternative is true and knowing that the, uh, significant, the test is significant. But with a small power, let's say 0.3, you have only maybe half the, the chance that this, uh, that this probability uh, of HA being true, knowing that the test is significant. And that's under the hypothesis that we have, the, uh, that's under the, uh, the condition that alpha is actually 5%. Now we know uh, that there is a p-hacking situation and we know that uh, there is uh, multiple comparisons that are not always corrected properly and we know that there is flexibility in the analysis. Uh, so uh, let's assume something which is more, I mean, probably likely in many studies, which is let's say alpha to 0.3. And then you see that even with a high power, like a 0 0.7, 0 0.8, uh, you have a PPV of something like a 0.3. So you have one chance of a three, roughly, that your uh, hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis is true, even when under the condition that uh, the test is significant. So that's not a good situation. Uh, so uh, let's uh, look at you know, what happens when the odd ratios are a bit uh, more favorable and uh, uh, or less favorable. And uh, using the alpha equal 0 0.05, like let's say we are in a very good situation, but we are still at with a power which is quite small, which is the uh, the usual power that we we have found in the uh, in the for instance in the Poldrack uh, paper, and the uh, and that means that even with something which is almost as likely for the hypothesis for the null than the for the uh, uh, for let's say the, the the alternative is actually twice uh, and more unlikely than the uh, than the null than uh, then we, 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 we do have some uh, reasonable PPV, but not too great one. But as soon as this odd ratio is, uh, is a bit less, uh, PPV is uh, going down very quickly. And if, I, you know, if we are with both situation of low power and, uh, and uh, risk of error quite uh, high, then uh, the, uh, the situation is, is really poor. Even with a very large odd ratio, 0.6, 0.7, you have a, a poor um, a positive positive value. 
how does this relate to uh, what epidemiologists would say is the positive predictive value? So it's positive predictive value is used in a completely different context, or not that different, I suppose, but a fairly different context, which is uh, to evaluate uh, a test, a clinical test, for instance, or a diagnostic test or prognostic test. Um, and this is uh, H1 here is basically uh, related to whether the uh, the, 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 the subject has a, is truly uh, a patient, or maybe and maybe here, here one, uh, H zero would be the uh, uh, the situation where the patient the uh, the, the subject is actually uh, a normal uh, doesn't have the disease. Uh, and the PPV uh, in this uh, instance uh, can characterize the test uh, by looking at the ratio of the uh, true positive of uh, the uh, sum of the true positive plus the false positive. And you can recognize that you know, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, power times R and R where R can be thought of the incidence of the disease uh, is actually going to give you something that is actually the, the, the number of true positive. And alpha here, uh, then, you know, if you multiply by the, the uh, number of uh, subjects in the population, we are actually giving you the false positive. So, that, so there's a clear you know, uh, reason why it's also called the PPV, uh, the positive predictive value. So in summary, uh, I would say uh, the, the main message here is that uh, it is an important measure, but it's a measure that is extremely hard to compute, a little bit like power. Power itself is hard to compute because it, it requires so, so much. Uh, so it, it, it requires power, which is hard to compute, it requires the prior odds, which we don't know. We just have to you know, guess or have a, an estimate of. Uh, and it requires the type one error, which is also sometimes hard to, co to, to uh, uh, control. Um, although those are uh, usually unknowns and hard to compute, uh, they, uh, having some rough estimation and, and uh, an idea is, is really important. Uh, and the process of estimating those quantities really help assess the solidity of the results. Uh, uh, and I would say that the second conclusion is that the uh, PPV is in general quite small and we really need to move towards uh, a larger sample size and, uh, and better control of, um, of uh, risk of error and, uh, and, and better power. In this uh, last section of the talk, uh, I want to touch upon the uh, uh, three kind of analysis frameworks, uh, hypothesis testing, machine learning, causality. And then I will uh, go a bit on the uh, aspect of uh, explanatory versus prediction model. The first one you are well uh, accustomed with, I suppose, uh, the hypothesis testing framework. Uh, it's dominated by the p-value estimation, the fx uh, size estimation, power analysis, as we talked about before in previous talks. Uh, and it's also, uh, just as a reminder, marred by the uh, p-hacking uh, problem that is uh, inflating our uh, uh, type one errors, false positive errors. It requires uh, to have the smallest variance as possible for getting a powerful test. What does it mean? Does it, mean that it means that the, the core that is chosen or the sample that are uh, chosen uh, are, are meant to be uh, uh, as with as little variance as possible such that uh, a test on those uh, samples would be very powerful, uh, which is a different as, you know, conception and, and, uh, and, and target that's uh, what we will see in the machine learning, where having some variance in the, uh, in the sample is important to actually predict on other samples. Uh, it often fails to see the distinction between statistically significant and scientifically or clinically significant uh, uh, results. That uh, I think is still often the case, uh, and mostly the hypothesis testing is still done with uh, having a zero uh, as a null hypothesis, like the you know, hypothesis is centered on zero rather than centered on an FX size that would be important for the theory or for the, uh, uh, the scientific goal uh, being investigated. It's a framework that is mostly interested in the modal parameters values and whether those uh, parameters are uh, estimated parameters are uh, uh, significantly different than zero. Uh, and it's a model that uh, cares about the generalization aspect, but uh, within the same population. So it, it estimates the variance of the population with the variance of the sample. 
the machine learning framework uh, is is rather different. It's not uh, orthogonal. It's not independent, of course, but it's a rather different uh, state of mind. It has obviously uh, exploded recently. It cares about uh, classification of prediction. Uh, and when I say prediction, I don't mean uh, for necessarily forecasting or prediction in the future, but it could be a prediction of uh, uh, some some label in the uh, in the in the cohort, something that has been already acquired. Uh, it has also the distinction between the supervised versus unsupervised, and you know that uh, supervised is when you have some labels, let's say a disease label or or some uh, uh, some known uh, labels for the for the samples. But unsupervised, you're just trying to estimate the structure of the uh, of your data. It doesn't really care about how the prediction is done. Uh, it really, uh, you know, to some extent, really it's building a black box. Uh, that uh, in, in that aspect, the uh, model uh, parameters are not important, but uh, the uh, variables themselves could be uh, assessed. The importance of the variables themselves can be, uh, uh, can be assessed. Uh, and that's something that is, is also a usual goal uh, in, the, um, in, the in the prediction machine learning framework. It definitely cares about generalization. Uh, often within the same sample, and uh, and that's the uh, what's well known as the cross validation technique, where you uh, put some of the data of the sample out, you just estimate parameters of the model on the uh, on some uh, some of the data, and then estimate the prediction error on the uh, on the uh, uh, holdout uh, data. But it doesn't often uh, or enough uh, look at out of study prediction. So if you were to apply that model. To a completely different data set, uh, how well that model would perform on that uh, out of sample, of, out of this study, uh, sorry, uh, sample. And the last uh, framework that I want to just uh, have a quick word on is the causality framework. Uh, to some extent, statistical models are often used uh, uh, as for causal explanation. Uh, this is because a uh, statistical model often, uh, let's say, take the linear regression model, you've got a value of y that is explained by some uh, uh, independent variables or, or co-variables. Uh, and those, those are really, like, uh, can be thought as the, uh, as the causal explanation of that variable. However, uh, a model with high explanatory power uh, uh, is uh, often assumed to be also a predictive model, but that's not always the case. And linear models can be uh, interpreted as causal models, as I said. Uh, again, the uh, predictive power is not necessarily uh, of, uh, sort of like a, uh, an insurance of causality. Uh, it, the effect of those uh, of those variables can be completely indirect, um, and uh, so you can have some uh, predictive power and absolutely no uh, causal uh, variables in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the model. The model for causal explanation and for predictions are often confused, and that's uh, because in general, uh, when you can actually predict well or explain well. Uh, people think that you know this is this means that this uh, th those variables are actually causing the effect, uh, and that's not again not the, always the case. So it does clearly there's been like a many many prediction you know, studies in the uh, in the framework of the prediction uh, machine learning framework, um, and that's uh, that's exemplified for instance in this book, which is you know a, a challenge on the ABCD data. Uh, to, uh, for instance, looking at you know how do you, can you predict uh, fluid intelligence in adolescents using brain imaging data. Um, the again, there's a the main I think my main point here is that there's a confusion between explaining uh, behavior, which is to accurately describe its causal brain underpinning, uh, and to predict behavior, uh, which doesn't need to have like a causal explanation at all. In the context of uh, uh, looking at models and looking at how we uh, we think about uh, uh, explanatory or, or prediction model, uh, I want to recall that there is a, a sort of distinction in our brain imaging community between the, the, the work of uh, forward inference and the work of uh, reverse inference. Forward inference, as you know, is like uh, trying to assess the probability of the uh, value estimate measured in the brain 
uh, in like uh, gray matter value, bold effects, connectivity, and so on. Uh, knowing the uh, psychological or the mental states or the pathological states of uh, uh, an individual. Uh, and the reverse inference is on the opposite is looking at, you know, what is the priority, what is the evaluation of this mental or, or pathology state of uh, knowing the brain, uh, the brain values. And that's, uh, that is a much harder task in some ways, and specifically it's a harder task if we think about uh, causal models because there are uh, a very large number of measurements in the brain. So if you have, if you think of a, uh, that revert inference uh, composing of uh, all the, uh, the brain be being composed of all the voxels in the, uh, in the brain imaging uh, acquisition, uh, there's many, many ways of predicting uh, some variables with uh, that many variables, of course. Uh, and that makes the uh, uh, the causality aspect uh, uh, a harder one. Um, so I just want to emphasize that uh, that you know in, in does in those prediction versus explanation framework, uh, the the forward and the reverse inference are definitely not uh, treated in, in in the same way. So going deeper in the prediction versus explanation uh, aspect. Uh, I would love, I'd have to say that sometimes the predictive model is often seen as uh, non-scientific in some ways because it doesn't focus on the causes. Uh, uh, while, uh, and, and prediction can be thought as a, a utilitarian aspect where uh, once you have a machine that can predict and you can reuse it and you, you don't actually care about the scientific goal of really understanding what's going on. Um, however, there's, uh, and I think that's really important, uh, there's really uh, a lot of scientific value in, in a good prediction model. Uh, so first of all, large and rich data sets such as the BCD data sets contain complex relationships and patterns that are hard to hypothesize uh, and are often prone to, uh, uh, to p-hacking. Uh, so please uh, pre-register your studies if you're using the uh, null hypothesis uh, testing framework. Uh, it can help, uh, the, a good prediction can help assess or improve uh, or choose between explanatory theories. Uh, and that's important. Like if you have a very, very good uh, predictive model for one theory and, and a very bad one for another, uh, then, then there's a good chance that uh, uh, that's the, the one with the very good uh, predictive power is actually uh, 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 closer to the, to the explanatory uh, aspect as well. It doesn't have to be, but it's, it's, there's a, a, a better chance that it is. A predictive model can be used to discover new measures uh, of operationalization of construct. Uh, I apologize for the uh, stuttering. The, uh, so, the, uh, so that's important as well. The, uh, when you have something that can predict very well, uh, then you can think of it as a new, possibly like a, a measurement of a new construct and think about you know, what that construct can do. So I want to uh, use here the uh, uh, Yarkoni and Westfall uh, paper in 2017 to go a bit some more in the, uh, like an example of a, of a model and, and, the, uh, and the possible uh, pitfalls um, of uh, of the classical way of thinking of the uh, statistical uh, testing. Most statistical uh, models are actually predictive models. So in, in this in this here, for instance, we, we are looking at uh, why, uh, the, the value y uh, being like a, a function of x. Again, depending on if you are in the, uh, in the inference or uh, the uh, reverse inference or the forward inference uh, uh, framework, x and y will be different. But here, let's take the example, like a, a simple example where there's only two axes uh, and, uh, and the model is fitted on, on some data. And that's uh, the second equation here where you have like some actual values for the parameters of that model. So imagine that you have a coefficient of determination of 50% uh, of the variance explained, so 0.5 for the coefficient of determination. This, uh, this coefficient of evaluation of, of determination evaluates the performance of fitting equation one and af after the fit. Uh, so it's really uh, the performance of uh, equation one once you have fitted uh, some value. Uh, it doesn't actually estimate the performance on new data. 
and uh, uh, Dalia Arconi and Jacob Westfall have actually taken an example where let's say you have 50 samples with 20 predictors, uh, each correlated to point one with the uh, uh, dependent variable. The observed uh, coefficient of determination will on average be 0 0.45. Uh, so that's because there's a lot of uh, predictors and, uh, and not that many samples. Uh, the true value in this situation could be uh, 0.07 and could be even a smaller value for the out of sample uh, coefficient of determination. So that's, uh, that tells you how bad things can go in terms of, um, of uh, predicting. Uh, uh, even if you think you have like a, a good explanation with 50% of the variance explained. This is uh, uh, a good illustration of this from, uh, from uh, uh, Talia Arconi and uh, Jacob Westford paper. Uh, showing here with uh, n equal 20 uh, sample, uh, the true uh, relationship between uh, x and y is this uh, curve in red here. Uh, the estimated uh, uh, value, uh, estimated relationship here is the, uh, the blue line, the fitted model, with just uh, one degree of freedom, uh, so uh, like a line. And here, the estimated uh, model here in blue is actually with uh, 10 degrees of freedom, so uh, a polynomial, polynomial with uh, a number of 10 uh, parameters. And, uh, and, the, uh, and this is the uh, uh, mean square error of the predicted on the training uh, data and on the test data. And you see how much uh, you know, uh, larger the test data, the predicted error is on the, pre on the, uh, on the test data. And the same thing, obviously, for these. Uh, uh, on the training data here, the, uh, the, the predicted error, the mean, mean square error is very small. Uh, the difference between the, uh, the model and the data is very small, but, uh, but clearly the, um, uh, on the test data, it's actually huge. Um, um, here, uh, this is just to show in this, in this uh, second line here that uh, if you have a, a large number of, uh, of sample here, 200 rather than, than 20, then this effect is mitigated uh, by, the, uh, by the large number uh, of sample. So uh, showing here that the, uh, uh, the, you know, this is the, the effect, uh, the model estimated here uh, that has, uh, and on the, on the test data has a, a, um, you know, a, a smaller kind of a, a smaller mean square. And, uh, and here, even though uh, we could have fitted some like a very, uh, uh, like the, the actual fitting with uh, uh, too many, I mean, many degrees of freedom, too many degrees of freedom is actually, that uh, is actually close to the true uh, model here. So a complex model, uh, actually, uh, if you have a lot of data, a complex model actually will, will be a reasonable uh, estimate of the, of possibly of the true, of the true model. To finish, I will uh, just want to uh, say more a, a bit more of the uh, conceptualization aspect. Uh, here, for instance, um, uh, let's uh, think about the prediction and explanation with the uh, uh, with uh, in, in 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 the abstract in some ways, um, where let's say we have some scientific construct x and y and some actual uh, causal function between those construct uh, x and y, which is uh, f bold here. And those cons uh, uh, constructs are operationalized by uh, X, Y, and F here. Explanatory modeling will actually look at, uh, at F and will try to uh, match the actual oper operationalization of, of the true F with like, a, let's say, a linear model or something, uh, such that the, uh, uh, it matches as closely as possible the, the truth, uh, the, the reality. Uh, the, uh, the prediction model doesn't actually care about finding to the, the true f, uh, the true function. It tries to estimate one f uh, amongst many uh, that minimize the expectation, the expected prediction error. The expected prediction error, uh, if you think about it, is the is actually the expectation. Uh, it's the difference of the uh, the actual data and the uh, estimated uh, F uh, on, on the data. So that's the expected predictor on, uh, on some unseen data. And that can be decomposed into uh, the variance of, uh, of the data, of Y, uh, plus uh, the bias of the, of the, uh, of the, ex ex uh, the estimated function, F at. 
So uh, the difference between the estimated function and the true function, uh, so that's the bias, and the, uh, and the variance of that estimation. Uh, so uh, the explanatory modeling focus on minimizing the bias. Uh, it really tries to, mini to find the true f and minimize the bias, uh, while the predictive modeling seeks to minimize a combination of both the bias and the estimation variance. Uh, occasionally sacrificing some you know, uh, theoretical accuracy uh, for the improved uh, ex uh, experimental accuracy on, on new data. Uh, resulting estimates can be remarkably different in the two contexts, uh, which is important to note. So in summary, uh, prediction is a powerful analysis uh, framework, very, very powerful, and uh, really should be, uh, I would say, largely used as soon as you have enough data um, for theory assessment and comparison for new hypothesis generation. Uh, and ultimately, theories are often in the context of explanatory and causal models. So uh, those two things uh, should probably be uh, uh, going hand in hand in any analysis, really. Thank you very much for your attention. And I want just to put a slide of my uh, funding uh, agencies and, uh, and thank you uh, to uh, many collaborators.